Judges ready? Timer ready? I hate you. Sharp, painful words like jagged glass thrust into a father's heart. That dreadful line finds its mark echoing through the mind of a dismayed parent who remains frozen in place, eyes wide with agony. Do you remember this unforgettable story from Finding Nemo? And that is just one. How many more memorable Disney movies are tucked away in your long-term memory? Love them or hate them, one thing you can say about Disney is that they really know how to tell a good story. What is it about this company that makes nearly everything they do so popular? Do they actually have a wizened old witch somewhere who looks in her crystal ball to read the hearts and desires of the masses? Is some evil CEO consulting with her mirrored wall asking which theme is the fairest of them all? Or maybe they just killed off the competition with poison apples. Or could it be that they have tapped into something God put inside all of us? A look at a few of their beloved films shows us that quite surprisingly, this highly successful and profitable marketer relies on biblical themes over and over again. Let's take Beauty and the Beast for starters. The tale of a prince whose sinful pride brings a curse not only on himself, but on his entire household. This immediately brings to mind one of the most important stories in the whole Bible, the fall and redemption. When Adam and Eve pridefully choose to make a decision against God's command to eat the forbidden fruit, they and all of their kingdom are placed under a curse, and only the true love of Jesus can reverse that curse. Interestingly enough, the little-known name of the prince in this movie is Adam. Like Adam in the Bible, his poor choices affect all who live in his sphere of influence. All the inhabitants of his kingdom are reduced to less than what they once were, from living beings to household items. In the same way, when Adam in the Bible errs, all of creation is changed from perfection to decay and corruption. The Bible tells us in Romans that creation was subjected to futility, and the ground is to produce thorns and thistles. Just as Lumiere constantly complains and longs for his original form, all of creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth and waits with eager longing to be restored. In both stories, man becomes positively beastly, an actual hairy, hunchback, oversized monster in the case of Disney's Prince Adam. But in the Bible, the first Adam's offspring still appear human-like, but behave as monsters when the very first son, Cain, kills the secondborn, Abel. The remedy for the curse in each account is the same. Someone must love the unlovable. In neither story can those who are cursed help themselves. They are entirely dependent on the mercy of others' kindness. Belle is the savior figure in this Disney movie. She willingly offers herself in place of her captured father. On a much grander scale, the Bible shows us Jesus, the perfect savior who willingly offers himself, and because of his love and death, the curse is reversed for all. Beauty and the Beast ends with all of the characters restored to their original states. The couple joins in a dance as the crowd joyfully gazes on. The Bible gives us an even richer ending, with all of creation changed into an even more glorious form, and the hope realized that creation itself is, will be set free from bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of God. But Beauty and the Beast is not the only Disney blockbuster that taps into vivid biblical images. What about Chicken Little? A nerdy little chicken is hit in the head with evidence indicating trouble is brewing. Later he learns the threat is alien invasion, certainly a hard sell for any messenger. He tries to warn others, but the warnings do not fit in their plans. They're more interested in playing baseball than thinking about possible disaster. This repeats a common theme found in scripture. The insignificant lone voice claiming unlikely catastrophe, who turns out to be correct, the Bible's Noah has been told clearly by God that judgment is coming in the form of a flood, even though it has never rained before. The unrighteous men of the day ignore Noah and the huge ship he begins to build, preferring to continue eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. Think of Jeremiah or Ezekiel or maybe even John the Baptist, chicken littles from the same mold the scorned messenger speaking truth and being ignored by most of the population. Although there are so many more meaningful Disney movies, finally, we have Finding Nemo. 
The story of a father who seeks out his son at great cost and never gives up on him. Nemo is a rebellious young clownfish who scorns his father's instructions. His disobedience causes his eventual captivity in a dentist fish tank. Nemo spits out the words, I hate you, to his devoted father Marlin, who responds only with love, pursuing his son in spite of inconvenience and danger. This is just an echo of a repeated theme found in scripture. God as the father who never gives up on his child. The prodigal son is one of the obvious cases where a son's ingratitude is met with only with con unconditional love. The greatest instance, of course, is the incarnation of Jesus, who leaves heaven to bring re rebellious children back to God. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Just as Marlin faces hatred and rejection from his son, the very one he so desperately wants to help, Jesus is also hated and rejected by the very people he has come to save. When Marlin faces sharks and jellyfish, Jesus endures far worse, scorning, whipping, being spat upon, and ultimately being killed. So why would Disney do this? Why do these biblical themes emerge in stories written by a company whose purpose is clearly not spreading the gospel? Well, maybe the Disney writers just can't help it. The book of Romans tells us, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Even though the majority of script writers and viewers are not Christian, God's story is still imprinted on the hearts that he made. Because of this, there are universal truths that we all recognize, truths that cut across human divisions like race, culture, and gender. These are stories that we are pre-programmed to recognize and respond to. The, the three themes mentioned here ring in every heart. People see the good in man and all creation, but wonder why there's so much bad in both. Deep down, people know the world is really not as it ought to be. Men and women, young and old, experience the voice of their conscience, that small, nagging voice, speaking of unlikely catastrophes, that often we try to quiet with play and diversion. And... Throughout our culture, everyone agrees that fathers and mothers, by definition, should sacrifice for their children and love them at all times, even if they don't deserve it. The Bible tells us that what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So it turns out that Disney's secret to success is really not a secret at all. They tell stories that reflect biblical truths which trigger reaction in our God-made human hearts. Disney is our greatest modern maker of fairy tales, and we see that yet again, as in all fairy tales over the years, these same stories keep rising to the top because at a deep level, they reflect the reality of the story God is telling through all creation. Even if they are doing it unintentionally, people can't keep from telling the story, and audience, can, audience can't keep from responding to these themes because they are fundamental to human existence. Thank you.